good afternoon and a very very warm welcome to this this important talk that is going to happen today in just next few minutes from now the title is very interesting what a lifetime's obsession with sports and books has given me not me karan gopal and he's going to talk about his experiences with all of you it's very heartening to see many of these young students sitting face to face today in probably the first interaction with uh, some of us uh, i will i will now invite karan gopal but before i do that let me give a very brief introduction although he doesn't need introduction uh, everybody at snu and even outside knows him but still as a formality i must do that karan gopal is the executive director at shivnade university he is an mphil and a masters from madras university he had spent tremendous number of years in in indian army and post that he moved to education industry and uh, did a phenomenal job with uh, a phenomenal school setup that we have at called as shivnade school uh, located in various parts of uh, ncr and now going to open shortly in other places as well after he joined uh, shivnade university he has been uh, pursuing his obsession with sports and books as well as the leadership uh, ethos that he brings to the table uh, the second uh, talk in this leadership series is now being uh, you know uh, given by karan gopal uh, we are all waiting for your talk sir you are now invited to the ras good afternoon it feels wonderful to have an audience physical and uh, students on campus the opportunity to speak we never thought that it will take a year and a half or more than a year and a half to get to the stage of uh, actually having students uh, in an audience and talking to you uh, this series as dr rajiv just explained is called the leadership series it's just for the university leadership to have the opportunity and for students to have the opportunity to interface with us and for us to share expertise and experiences uh, you had dr galande giving a incredible talk on one of the areas which which is his area of expertise about understanding our genes maybe through the conversation around sports and reading there would be some connect with the genes so i'm trying to figure what those connects are going to be let me also just share that i like this to be interactive so it's the first time we're having this audience for a long time you know the online interaction is very different so be prepared uh, to think while the conversation is going on and to answer questions those chocolates there are for the right answers okay so this is because I'm a school person, so I distribute uh, chocolates. But at the same time, I think chocolates everybody likes. Chocolate, by the way, is uh, something which is very akin to sport. You know, the joy of playing sport and the joy of eating chocolates is the same thing, and we'll sort of discover it as we go along today. So this is a topic uh, I have never done before, uh, but interestingly, I have always grown with both these things throughout my life, and. in so many ways for a student at the university a university such as ours which is the shivnada university with a 300 acre campus and the amount of sport that you have and the fact that students are here to use a library and research and read you have a great combination to do all these things which i'm going to talk to you about and i'll just share my sort of journey and my experiences and maybe there could be some things you from there okay I'll come back to this. By the way, uh, where is this photograph from? Okay, so you know I'm proud of this photograph. I'm proud of August and September in the university. It's always some of the most stunning sights that you can see. After the rains, when it clears up, the sky is always blue, the clouds always that white, and we have to stop and pause and see. Only then you see the beauty. uh this is yesterday while cycling back from morning badminton but i stopped and sort of i realized it covers what i'm going to say 
right. You have got a library on one side which is reading and you have got your hostels on the other side which is where you live and where you choose to either play sport or sleep till 9, okay. So, that is why it is so connected, but it is a it is a lovely shot and I love the opportunity with my phone camera, okay. So, what are we talking about? Simply why sport and why reading, right, why sport and why reading. So, if there is anything I would like you to take away a year and a half. Uh, hour and a half later, hour and 20 minutes later is to try and figure why sport and why and is there more than just playing in sport and is there more than just reading a book in books, right. So, that is what we are going to talk about, okay. So, where did the sport and the reading obsession come from for me? So, a little of a personal context that will give you where I come from, every story that you hear every prof that speaks to you, you should actually insist that the first day and the first talk should be about the person, because that gives you context. So, that gives you the context of the rest uh, semester and the person and where it is coming from, it is not just enough to know the discipline that you are learning. So, for me, uh, I am the son of a professor but the professor is also a sort of a traveling professor. So, many professors stay for 10, 15 years in the same place. My father chose to be a professor who was a professor of international relations. Uh, he was a Fulbright scholar, he went to Carnegie Mellon, he uh, was in Soas in the UK and uh, he was in India where JNU started with called the Indian Institute of uh, International Relations at Sapru House. If you, you know Sapru House, Connaught Place, anyone? Um, how many from Delhi? Okay, so JNU started from there. That's where my father was initially. Then he was in Indian Institute of Advanced Studies in Simla. Anyone from Simla? Anyone been to Simla? Been to Simla? Lots of people. So the President of India, before that the Viceroy of India had a lovely house in Delhi and a lovely house in Simla. Heard of that? that used to be called the Viceroy's Lodge, it became the Rashtrapati Nivas in Simla, because when the summer was very hot the Viceroy used to go there. That professor Dr. Radha Krishnan said, it is too much of a luxury for a president of India, poor country like us to have two palaces for the president, he said give it away and make it a academic institution. That became the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies where professors across India used to go. And my father was there for four years, so I went to St. Edward Simla, then we went to Singapore, the Singapore University, Delhi, Delhi University. So, what happens in the campus life is lots of sports facilities, lots of books and conversations around books and also the opportunity to play with elder people. So, obviously, when you challenge yourself playing with elder people, you get sharp with your sport. And that is sort of been my journey of living on a campus in my childhood. And there is another very interesting thing which happened to me, which is that I got built in with a playmate from the time I was born, which means what? Anyone? How do you get built in with a playmate when you are born? Twin. So, when you have a twin brother, you are in competition from the time you are 3 or 4 or 5. So, my earliest competitions were on the floor with books folded like that as table tennis nets and table tennis ball and books to play, because it is too big to get a bat. But it was fierce competition by the time we were 5 and 6 and 7 and between football, cricket, badminton, we were always competing as to who is better at what. By the time we go to high school, Army Public School Dhalakwa, uh, I was school captain. Sorry, I was sports captain, but my brother was school captain, but I was better than him at cricket, I was better than, we were equal at football, he was better at basketball, he won 100 meters, I won 200 meters. So, competition happened throughout our life. So, it was very easy, that is my son, we are playing basketball, I am 50, 10, 12 years ago. So, that is just to give you the background 
to the sports part. The background to the books part was obviously interesting for those of you who have seen professors, been with professors and maybe children of professors is that a professor's house generally has more books than furniture. So our house had a lot more books than furniture. We often did not have drawing room furniture or a dining room table whenever we moved, but there were books and books. So what I'm also saying is I was privileged both in having books and having sports facilities throughout my life. Some of you may not have that privilege. So it's more difficult for you to become sporty or to become somebody who's reading. So you maybe you have to seize that to say, it was easy for someone who grew up with books and grew up with sports and you know people to play with. But if you think it's valuable you have to make that effort and I would say first and second year of college is a great time to realize that because sport is life, right? Okay. So we start with Q to C. You know what is Q to C? Q is quiz and C is chocolates. Okay. So sorry for if people are out there on the YouTube channel, uh, you won't get to get the chocolates. But it's for everyone here. What's common between sports and books? What's common? If you look at a life journey of sport and a life journey of books and say it's a passion, what do you think is common? Yep. Straight away chocolate goes, what's your name? Karan, you get two. Huh? Tanuj, what do you play? What do you read? Non-fiction. Non-fiction? Non-fiction. What? Drinking and growing rich, pretty good. Are you doing a business school program? No? Thinking and growing rich, so great. So absolutely spot on Tanuj because what's common is a quest for learning and a quest for improving and a quest for excellence. Now we all want to do this, right? Through sport, the fact is you go pick up a sport, the next week you're saying, am I going to be better? Because if you're not pushing yourself to be better, you're really not enjoying going there again. The only reason you go there is to play better, right? And it's a quest for learning and quest for improve, improving and a quest for excellence which should drive us through our life. So I'm 62. If I think I need to retire now, people start thinking of it. <coughs> you start wondering what's going to be your purpose of your life if you start retiring because you can't just be eating and sleeping and enjoying the weather. You know, how long will you do that? Whereas when you're working, you're always pushed because you're saying, I'm getting better at what I do, right? And that's the common ground for reading. Why do you need to read? Because you say, wow, this looks interesting. This gives me a new perspective. I haven't thought of this before. Can I use it in my context? That's what we do from reading. And it can happen through fiction too, okay? In fact, fiction sometimes pushes us to think about ourselves a lot more than nonfiction. So it's also great. Introduce and talk about a few books. So great. So this is the National Defense Academy after school. And for all of us, we're so proud of 300 acres here. The NJ is 7,000 acres. OK, we have uh, 100 basketball courts and about 30 football grounds. So obviously, if you go to the National Defense Academy, then you get opportunities to play a lot more, right? We have a lake seven kilometers big, right? So you can do lake swimming and things like that. But there's something here, which is hunter squadron, the toughest squadron, right? Now, which uh, hostels are you all living in just randomly? Divang? And? So 1A, 1B, 1C is banned. Okay, with effect from 2021, you will only say Gir, Dibang, Kaziranga. What are these? National parks. I hope you know the animals of those parks. What's Kaziranga? Lion? Rhino. Where is the lion? Gir. Okay, great. So that's the idea. Now, the idea is of to change the name from 1B to make it Kaziranga and Gir because 
firstly the foundation is invested in wildlife and conservation. So, it goes with, with that right and it is incredibly important right conservation animals and preserving them is incredibly important. So, goes very well with the foundation and what we as young people and students need to do is to conserve it. Right? So, that is the reason why it is also very important, but it is also important to build a spirit around your host right. So, the one thing that you will do as you go along and start getting the gear identity and the Kaziranga identity and the Debang identity is to say I belong to that host house and that will have also happen through sport. So, we must soon start a inter host boys and girls football team for example, which I am looking forward to seeing and other other sort of sport. So, that is that is the idea that is what happens by the way in the national defense academy our identity of our squadron is so strong sports become so big that it is it is life and death and you learn a lot from that ok. So, here we go with a few lessons from sport uh, what is the foremost lesson from sport anyone leadership team spirit never give up attitude ok. Interestingly none of them are in my five, but they are all supremely important anything else Sunita Anjali pardon discipline ok. Hard work and if you have a really tough coach what happens you have discipline about what you cannot eat and uh, it is also life lessons right these are all life lessons if you have a if you have a coach or a teacher who does not tell you that you are doing a bad job and these are the ways to improve then that is not really a great teacher or a coach or a mentor right. And the sports teachers and the coaches as you call them are some of the hardest people that you can have because they will generally tell you straight up ok. So, you are right that the usual lessons of sport are what you there is discipline, there is team spirit, there is camaraderie etcetera, but I have just tried to put down in all my years what are the sort of things that I think are. The interesting thing about sport look at a 5 year old or a 6 year old or a 7 year old starting sport for the first time we are talking about proper sport or Govind and Gopal my twins name sitting with this books folded and starting with this ping pong ball little thing and using our notebooks to hit it across. What do you think we are doing after the first few days when we are doing that first and what happens to a little child's brain when you start playing sport competitively if I may say what is the first thing that you are learning ok. The first thing you decide is if it hits the top of that book and falls this side what happens you will get a point. If it happens and goes other side and it goes anywhere what is the next thing you do you draw lines. So, the first thing what you notice in this photograph a, six, a 60 year old Gopal playing tennis now what are you noticing boundaries. So, the first thing you notice is there are lines and there is a net. So, one of the first things you learn about sport is that there are rules and you play by the rules because life is like that right. There are many things which may not be like that, but actually many things in life are like that. Do boyfriends and girlfriends have rules? Yes, some people start spelling it out right you better text me 10 times a day right. If you do not return my call then listen bye bye. So, they become like rules right. Uh, so, that is one of the first lessons of sport that even after that little table tennis game somebody say hey listen is it out or in we will draw lines on the other side then say right. Then what are the rules for this particular sport. So, for me one of the first rules of sport is play by the rules. So, for example, what is the time to enter your class in school and in college? Suppose the class starts, suppose to start at 9, 
855 in school and in college? 10. <laughs> okay. So, if you are a sports person, you generally will see that the sports person is generally punctual. Because when you say a basketball game started at 9, if you tell the tell the 9, 5 ko poncho na, somebody will say you can stay outside. You do not get to play. You go to the airport for a flight which is at 10 o'clock, you can't say, listen, I am a normally a late guy, I will reach at 10, 15, please hold on to the flight, does not happen. Right? It is a very Indian thing to believe that you can be late everywhere and it's chalta hai and it does not work in a lot of places. But a sports guy knows it because you are always conditioned to say, I have not seen tournaments which are start to start at 10, 15 to say, okay, it does not matter, a few players are late, let us start at 10, 30. Try it in the Olympics, you get disqualified. They do not care that the bus got stuck somewhere, they, it just does not matter. You are not there, you are not there. So, that is rules, right? So, sports has rules, so the first rule. Okay, but yet never settle for the second best, right? Having rules is not enough, never settle for the second best. That is every day in the morning, that is the over 90 team of Shivnada University, which is Gopal and Ujjwal sir. And we take pride in beating the next best team, which is Ashish Thokcham sir and Jitender sir. We played 60 times during the pandemic, they won how many, guess? 19. We count, okay? Every day it is fierce fight. Sandeep sir is here, but uh, then the second team, okay? They do not yet qualify to get into our team. But the, the fact is, the only advantage I have, I have two major advantages. I opt for the court, which is the better one on the other side. This has some light problem, and I opt for the coach to play with. <laughs> so I never get to lose, right? So, but having said that, uh, Play by the rules is fine, but you win, you play for this. That is the other lesson of sport. Anjali and Sutta are here. They are top 20 of India in squash. I think they are rising the rankings very soon. They are our second year now, second year students who are squash scholarship students at Chivnata University, the first people. They just finished a fantastic tournament. They played against the top 7 or 8 of India at SNU. Did anyone watch? Raise your hands, how many people got? So, please use the facilities, HCL does these big sponsorships for the squash tournaments, but they do not enter a court to just play. You do not enter a university without a plan what you want to do, right? You must start and write down what your plans are. That is why you enter a university. You do not do chemical engineering without a plan. You should not do history without a plan. You should have or sort of years, but sport teaches you that is what you do, you play to win, right. That is Anjali, I think, okay, do not be embarrassed, okay. The other big lesson of sport is this and this is the greatest lesson of sport, right, which is learn from the losses and get used to losing, okay. Here is quiz number two, number two, right, okay. There are only four things adults worry about in their life, one, two, three, four. There is no fifth thing. And in real life, you get to my age, when you look back on your 50 or 55 years of memory, because you do not remember your first five years, you look through your life and you know that there were some years where you were up and some years you were down and some years you were up and some years you were down, which is the way of the world. And sport teaches you that you got to keep managing this. You will never, however good you think you are and however brilliant squash uh, badminton coach is your partner, you will still lose 19 times. Roger Federer loses, Nadal loses, right? Uh, the uh, Virat Kohli's uh, crazy team which is steamrolling every opponent right now, even they lost the last test, they won this, right? So, Everybody loses and you get used to it and you learn from it. So, what are the four things adults worry about in their lives? Children? Family? Family, money. So, relationships, money. Health, career. So, there are only four things we worry about. Thank God health came to third. I have done this a thousand times. Health is always fourth. 
the pandemic has helped move up one rank. It's come up one rank. Health is first. If you don't have health as a family, you don't have health as an individual, you don't have a life. Right? So health is your top priority in life. There are only four things. When you look back on your life, you realize health 2015, very bad. I had this problem. Relationships, okay, 2014 was bad, right? Um, son fought with you, wife had a problem. Uh, 2019, okay, we had a really bad year and money wasn't so great. Life's like that. But sport teaches you every day you play competitively, that's life. You play by the rules, you're still going to lose, you still have to handle it. There's always tension. When you do a PhD presentation, what do, you, what do, you, what do we call it? We defend the... When you do thesis defense, how do you feel? Easy? Terrible, difficult, stressful. So that's how life is. I come here, I must have done these type of things thousand times where I'm still a little stressed in the morning. Oh, did I get this right, the sequence right? That's life. But when you're playing every day with Ashish Tokcham and, uh, you know, Jitender sir, obviously, heart tension. Every day you're going through that. So your body gets used to it. Your, I'll tell you what else gets used to it as we go along. But that's what sport does to you. It says, okay, you have that little stress out there. You've done it before. Your body is used to the tension of play, match play, which they do. Imagine playing India number three. Anjali, you played India, India number three? India number two. Imagine she's 19, 19, 19 year old playing India number two in home court, right? First time tournament which will give you tournament points and I think you got, I just learned you got some dollars to win. How many were there? Seven, eight hundred. Thirty-two thousand. Oh, big treat. So, but imagine entering that match, you're playing against a India number two and you have to be under stress, right? But that's life. So, tomorrow you have a bad situation and there's an accident and you say, oh, accident, your body is used to it. So that's what sport does to you. Learn from losses and get used to losing. Okay. And obviously the big one, yes, Krishna. Yeah, you uh, should definitely play for fun. Uh, only losers play for fun. Only losers play for fun. Okay. I am joking. I am intensely competitive, right? You must play for fun. You should uh, enjoy it as you get better. But if you are checking yourself, are you improving? Are you getting better? Then you have to play with somebody and say, this is match play and I will get so many points of you, right? So there's nothing wrong in playing for fun also. It keeps you fit, right? But it may keeps you fitter if you play for points and competitions and things like that. But there's nothing wrong in playing for fun. Okay, that is Jay sir, my batchmate from the National Defense Academy, right? So, and that is Dr. Upendra, uh, Jitendra, right. So, that's the other team we keep playing in the morning. But that's what we always do. Uh, learning from mistakes in everyday life is very difficult because firstly, you don't accept mistakes. It's very difficult. But when the shuttle goes out and your shuttle hits the net or your ball and squash goes out, you know it's a mistake. It's done. So there's nothing to argue. So you get used to the fact that did I do it and get better at it. Okay. Very important. Know your competition. Now, while, for example, when we play with Jaisa, we know that he's got a very wicked half court smash. Right? And this is again true in life. When you are in any field, where you're in marketing or in sales or whatever, or even your boss is not your competition, is not your enemy, but you got to know the person. But sport is always telling you, know the other person, know the other person, right? So knowing the other person is not just about yourself. It's about trying to figure what's the context of the other person. In this case, it's a game, but things like that, right? I think the greatest lesson out of all these 
is this one. When you play sport, you are always reflecting. You are always sitting back and say, why did, why did I lose? Why did I not do this properly? So, there is a process which gets built into the brain which is saying reflect, 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 right. And that is something we need to do in our life in everyday things we do. You screw up somewhere, you say reflect, what happened, right. And the best people like them, they have coaches who tell them, right. You got to self coach sometimes or you have to have with a friend and say I did this badly. So, you have to have a system of reflection, sport teaches you automatically but that is true for everything in life. So, for me these are some of the most incredible lessons from a lifetime in sport. Uh, having said that, sport like life is just a game, sport like life is just a game, even life is a game. What did Shakespeare say? Chocolate for that? Two chocolates, both of you got it. All the world is a stage and and what is your name? And all the men and women are merely actors and players on that stage, right. So, sport also when you finish the game and you lose and you feel bad, you say it is just a game, ok. It is all right, it is not life and death, but even our life is like that. Right? Even our life is like that, you are here for 40, 50, 60, 70 years, you are on stage for a while, there is a big of darkness before we came here, it is going to be darkness afterwards, unless you believe in afterlife. How many of you believe in afterlife? Afterlife, ok. Otherwise, we are just here for a little while. So, that is one of the lessons of sport that at the end of the day, win or lose, it is over it's okay get back to learning and that's those are but this is my greatest observation that includes shivnada university all the people i meet who play sport generally i find them smiling laughing greeting you saying hello and all those who i never see them they have glum faces matlab bahut serious face aise karke chalte hain dekhenge bhi nahi sports wale hasthe hain Sports makes you laugh and makes you realize that this is all the world is a bit of a stage and you know it is ok, because that is something about sports people who play or generally and there is a reason for that ok. But before that, uh, so play sport ok. Now, here is the scientific connect if you may need it. How many of you in school of natural science? Students, natural science, only one. See all the serious people not here. Ok, natural science, what is the connection between physical activity, which which area are you from? Physics ok, not well there is a little bit of physics, but there is physics, there is chemistry, there is biology and life science of course, in what I am trying to say, there is physics too, because there is movement, but what do you think is the connect between the mind and the body? Yeah it produces dopamine ok. What else? Oxytocin, two more, serotonin, one more, dopamine, what is, what are dopamines and so for example, for the scientific community who is here, you have to have a reason to play sport, I am giving you those reasons ok. It is not just ja ke khel kood ke aise time waste ho gaya, tumhare body mein chemicals produce hote hain khelne se those chemicals are good for you, they, produ they are produced from here, they go from here, go through to the nervous system and go into the brain, right. And those are some of the four hormones, what are they called? Two chocolates, you got it? Wow, many chocolates are running out. They are called the happy hormones, so for those of you who do not know, please read, just google happy hormones. Sport gets you to produce happy hormones in your body. 
if you are going to sleep at 4 o'clock at night or try to sleep by staying awake the whole night and you are too tired to get out and then too tired at night again to go back to your mobile phones and, and your Google and being a grandfather right now, you are wasting your time at SNU with a campus like this. If you do not get out and play sport and I am talking to all those people who could be watching on YouTube or uh, are going to watch this video, your body needs exercise your body needs exercise for the chemicals it produces because of exercise and those chemicals are good for your brain, it is good for your PhD, it is good for your marks, right? it is good for your assessments and it is good to make you a better all round person. So, it produces hormones, but I think it also does things like it helps you take decisions. Imagine a squash player who has got balls coming at her at an incredible speed you got to be thinking do I play the drop shot, do I say play the parallel shot, do I play the cross court shot, everything is happening with your brain like that in every sport, right. A leg spinner loops a ball and throws at you and you are a batsman, you are waiting, you are deciding whether to go down the wicket or play defensively or play at the crease or go on the back foot, you are doing this all the time. Life is about taking decisions, right. Your brain has to be tuned to take decisions and that is what sport does you, it tunes brain to take decisions. So, sports people take a lot of decisions, I did not want to talk military stuff here, but some of the sports people in war, you realize that they are the guys who have done incredible because you do not get all the inputs to take a decision sometimes, but you have to take a decision, right. When a squash ball comes to you here, you are not always sure where your opponent is, you cannot say I will wait to see where the opponent is by the time, right. So, it helps you take decisions and all those hormones we talked about, it takes you nimble and ok. Now, who are these superheroes? <coughs> ok, what is special about Dr. Vivek Banerjee other than the fact he is the Dean of School of Management? You are looking at the photograph and guessing, ok, he is not a trekker. He is a mountaineer. How many in the management school, business school here? So, please do remember that your dean is a big serious mountaineer, not just a trekker, ok. And Dr. Rajat Kathuria, how many in the school of humanities here? Ok. What is special about him? What is special about him? Nobody knows. He was India number 3, he was the Indian team in the 80s, he was the Indian team, he played table tennis for India, he played Asian games, he played commonwealth, he's, he's a India, right. And what is special about Dr. Galande? He looks half his age. Okay, and he is a crazy gymmer, he, you see him 5 days a week in the gym and other and after that he plays squash and he is learning squash, right. So, the point is and Dr. Sandeep said I could not find the photograph of him playing tennis, but when all things are okay he comes and plays tennis out there and Dr. Tuli, Dean of Research is a trekker, serious trekker every single year, right. Um, maybe a few times a year, but serious checker. So, the point I am trying to say is you, you can be brilliant at your discipline, but they are people who understand the idea of physical activity exercise of a very high level and that will add to who you are as a professional and the discipline that you are in, right. Okay. <coughs> now, we are turning track and talking about books that is just a, like a shot of some of the books on my bookshelf, I just like that part and these are some of my favorite books. Uh, that is by the way in the clubhouse library, this one on the right, we have a little library which has not really exploded with the sort of reading culture we can have, but this is the uh, faculty and staff clubhouse and these are, these are my life's possessions just as much as sport is crazy for me, but so are books. So, there are only three ways to learn, one, two, three, each one is a quiz and each one is a chocolate 
to give away. There are only three ways to learn. And reading does not count in your answer because it is obvious, right? So, other two? Hmm, you cannot say visual, say visual, say kya, like what? Observation. Okay, there is one rule of chocolates. You may be right, but only those three points on my slide, if you get, are you going to get the chocolate, right? <laughs> Even if you are right. Okay, three ways to learn. You still have not got there. Who said travel? Travel, someone said travel. You are not counted, you hear me all the time. Okay, travel. Young people travel extensively. I meet people who come here for four years from South India. Do you go to Taj Mahal? No. Did you go to see Redford? No. So, you are going back to Telangana. Like you have come to Dadri and you go back. Travel, travel, travel. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you just arrived. I am talking about those who are here for all this time, right? So, travel is the greatest teacher. Travel is the greatest teacher. You have an opportunity, you have changed your regions, you have gone from one place to another, travel, travel, travel. Get an opportunity, travel, go anywhere. Just for this little lecture, even on the, on the, on the internet you can travel. I went to Arunachal Pradesh, where I have served and I read about something and I was thinking, because I have travelled there, it is easy for me to remember that I went to a Tirup sector and I saw the tribes there and I was reading and relating, right? And I was thinking to myself, those people are Indians, you know, because we sit in Delhi think this is India. This is not India. You go 50 kilometers from here, you will see a different India. And then you say, oh, I am a humanity student. Your class cannot be your classroom. Your class is out there. If you are a humanity student or a history student or archaeology student, whatever student, if you do not go out there and observe, you are not really a student. So, travel is your greatest teacher, right? And you did not get the chocolate, but meeting and listening to interesting people is your second greatest teacher. Those teachers listening to interesting people do not have to be only your professors of chemical engineering or you know biology or chemistry or whatever, it has to be varied. Your great opportunities here at SNU, the sort of lectures you get, sort of people you get, because we are close to NCR, people come here and uh, Dr. Rajiv organizes, you know, when, when it is a proper university with everybody on campus, <coughs> I think we have Thursdays where we have two hours where there are no classes, there are no lectures to attend which is regular, but you have got guests who come here and then there, sometimes I feel there are not enough students. How can you lose the opportunity to listen to the best in the business? And now on top of that, you've got online, you've got TED Talks. There's not a subject in the world that you can't get exposed to, provided you're not playing video games all the time or the rest of the distractions that you can have, right? So the world is at your feet about meeting and listening to interesting people, but because you can't travel every day and because you will never meet interesting people every day, this is what you can do every day, right? And reading, it is interesting. Either you, as I said, for me to become someone who reads was not great. I grew up with books around me. You grow up with eggs around you, you are going to eat it, right? You grow up with papdi chart around you, you are going to eat it, okay? But if you do not grow up with books, it is not that easy. So, you have got to remember and think of it and say, I will have a collection of five books because I think I like what Gopal sir said. So, you know that is the way to go. So, I am going to expose you to a few books. Uh, so, I will talk about five books among many and I choose may not choose to talk about the Godfather. Has anyone read any of these books? Which one? The Carnegie Mellon one because Professor Akash is from Carnegie Mellon. So, the good, good reason to read Dr. Ron, uh, Randy Posh's book and we will talk about it. Anyone else has read any of these books? You listen to me? Okay. Anyone else? Any of these books? Oh, they are completely varied. How many of you have 10 books with you if your hostels are students at the at home right now in your hostels? Other than textbooks, please. Anyone? 
kindle ha huh? yeah you should have carried it with you from home right okay so we are going to talk about these books and before i tell you about the last lecture i'll just tell you to make you before you see this very short video let me tell you the story 2007 this carnegie mellon professor called dr randy posh computer science professor like dr rajiv right was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer pancreatic cancer confirmed by next year september 07 that you got 6 months to live and he had four children all young and he wanted to then decide how to do and get get along with his life because he knew that's the time he has uh, and the other thing is i am in and he said i like to do a last lecture now it's it was known in nominally good health stop stop please so it is known in america in universities that a professor if he has only a few things to say before he leaves the world what are those things he'd like to say so it is called the last lecture but it wasn't that people were dying and therefore they were doing this but in case of dr randy posh he was dying right and this is one of the most brilliant books you can ever get there's a brilliant one and a half hour youtube video about the last lecture which he actually gave and it's on youtube you can google it it's got some 7 million views and this book must have also sold some 10 million copies right but what and i read it very very often flip through it what it teaches me is that do you really need to die or be threatened by death to think of all these things and to bring this up in your life when you are 16 17 18 if you sort of reflect and read it you will see some of those lessons but having said that and before i come to a few things let's just go and see a 30 second clip better place for the family to be volume this is just the beginning and it's only 30 second just to wet your appetite so that you can go back and you know Down see it yourself Uh, and the other thing is i am in phenomenally good health right now i mean is the greatest thing of cognitive dissonance you will ever see is the fact that i am in really good shape in fact i'm in better shape than most of you <laughs> so anybody who wants to cry or pitter me can come down and do a few of those and then Okay. So this will take a few more minutes but this is what he says while for the most part I'm in terrific physical shape I have 10 tumors in my liver and I've only a few months left to live. The less obvious part is how to teach my children what I would have taught them over the next 20 years because he had only a few months to go. They are too young now to have those conversations. All parents want to teach their children right from wrong. what we think is important and how to deal with the challenges of life the challenges life will bring now that's just the introduction part i will go to something quite interesting here and wonderful things here for example i'll come to some of those but what were his childhood dreams what were his childhood heroes and how does that become part of the conversation for him to share with his children but remember 7 million 15 million people saw that there's something here which struck me there's a two page chapter which says a skill called leadership has anyone seen star trek one two because it's a few generations away now star trek did now yeah you know there's something called somebody called captain kirk right So Captain Kirk was a huge hero for Randy Bosch and Randy Randy said what did he bring he was no expert right so he said he brings in a skill called leadership and how, and how did he describe leadership so i remember that because one is obvious other two are not so obvious he said because he knew how to delegate so as you rise and get responsible you have to figure am i also delegating enough right so that's a interesting one he also had the passion to inspire that's what all leaders anywhere are supposed to do right and he said something very interesting after that 
and he looked good in what he wore to work. Right? So, do leaders need to look good in what they wore, wore to work? For example, these interns and now employees of Shivnada University, they have learned that in my office you cannot come in jeans every day. So, on Friday I say I will turn my blind eye, okay, wear what you want, but you got to be dressed. Now, I'm not saying it is important, maybe it is my background, but Randy Porsche is saying it. Okay. So, remember that there is, uh, there is a way to dress when you do something and therefore, do that. For example, when you play golf, regardless of uh, what your university, our university rules are, golf has a dress. If you do not wear a collar, you cannot play golf. It is nothing to do with your swing, but golf rules, right. You cannot wear jeans, golf rules, right. That is why I said rules of the sport. Right. So, interesting that he calls that that, but it is a absolutely stunning book about somebody who was dying. But let me try to summarize some of the great lessons from this marvelous book. Try and get it. Guys, instead of ordering pizzas all the time, order books, they get delivered here. Even if it is late, it does not get stale okay? and they get delivered. So, one is to follow your childhood dreams. So, just write them down and see what your childhood dreams are. He talked about a skill set called leadership and he talked about Captain Kirk, but look at this. Experience is what you get when you do not get what you get. Is not that a great line? So, when you do not get what you get, you get experience. It is good. So, losing sometimes is okay, right? That is what it means. And the most interesting is gratitude. This whole book is about gratitude, gratitude to, to the mother and father. Now, for those of you who are here for the first time, left your parental home, maybe I could ask you, I hope you are calling your mother once a day, at least. Right? She is waiting for the call. You may be busy in your lives and you may be thinking of something else, but that is gratitude also other than love. Love, affection for sure, but whether you feel like or not, that is gratitude. And I always do these acronyms, sometimes I forget. Gratitude and you do not need to what? Chocolate. <laughs> it is my lesson from the last lecture, 10, 12 years ago when I read it. You do not need to feel like dying to express gratitude. You know, when you know you are dying, you start feeling, but you can always feel gratitude. And you must always have gratitude. For example, you should actually feel gratitude for the first family of the Shivnada Foundation to set up this university and actually subsidize everybody's fees, whether you, whether you know it or not, but everybody's fees hugely subsidize. That is gratitude. To know there are some people out there who are able to give away 7,000 crores of their rupees of their money to set up institutions for the good of this country, for good of all of us. That is gratitude. You remember that there is somebody like that, right? And therefore, there are some rules and some expectations that people have. So, that is gratitude. But the gratitude is a lesson from this book and you must always do it. Completely different book. Anyone knows who this person is? Chocolate? Who is this person? Okay. So, he is he was called by Fortune magazine as the CEO of the century. He is Jack Welch, right? And Jack Welch, his company grew some thousand times in the 20 years that he was the CEO from 18, 1981 to 2000, right? And uh, anyone heard of Warren Buffett? Who is that? So, no chocolates because so many of you know. He said, if there is one management book to read and no other, it is this one. Okay? It is short, it is crisp, it is points. Okay. And Jack Welch, for example, talks about what are winners made of. Right? As you go into adult life and as you get forward. So, he says, the first test of winners is integrity is something of a fuzzy word. So, let me tell you my definition. People with integrity trail the truth and they keep their word. 
that's what organizations look for, that's what you will look for if you start your own organizations, that's the sort of people. They take responsibility for past actions, admit mistakes and fix them, right? That's integrity. Uh, for example, let me get into dangerous space here. If you're not supposed to uh, have beer in your room and maybe worse, but if you do and someone tells you and you say, yes, I screwed up, do whatever, but I admit my mistake. It's not an Indian thing to do, right? Indian thing is to say, sir, actually, you know, this happened and you know, it's not me, it's somebody else. I don't know how it came to my room. You know, I don't know where the bottles came from, but it's not me. So anyway, the, it's much easier to say, sorry, I screwed up. I shouldn't have done it. Whatever punishment is fine, but get over it. That's integrity. The second test is obviously intelligence, right? And the third ticket to the game is maturity. Remember, I'm not talking books too much to you. I'm just introducing little, little things so that you buy it. I don't get a percentage for selling these books. OK. Now, that's Jack Welch, but I love the book for these things, for saying that the ingredients of great leadership are the four E's and one P. What are the four E's? What are the four E's? So can you imagine simplifying that leadership is about just these things? Yes. Empathy, Empathy OK. Resilience. Resilience. Remember, only if you get the Jack Welch 4, you will get chocolates. Huh? Uh, this is not even Gopal's. OK. So this is why you must read. We have some perceptions. And then you read a great guy who's made his company grow a 1,000 times. And he says, these are the four E's. Then you say, oh, very interesting. I should have that. But I actually used this. In spite of my 30 years in the army, when I joined the outside world, I said, this looks great. First is energy. OK, he's not talking about leadership. He's saying this is the ingredients of great leadership, that if you don't have energy, physical energy, mental energy, you can't lead, right? So there's a body and a mind in, involved there. Second is to energize other people. It's not enough to have your energy when you say, you are an idiot, you are an idiot, all of you are idiots. Nobody knows anything, only I do everything. I'm running around. You'll never be a leader unless people. So what I did to myself is to say, nine of the 10 times when people walk into my office, do they go out happier and energized when they leave my office? That's my test. That's the ability to energize other people. One other time, you can bonk someone at the head. Because you're supposed to do that too and say there are mistakes and this is not OK. But that's energy. And that's the ability to energize other people. Edge. Now, edge in Jack Welch's language, I hope I have flagged this one, is something which is just incredible, which is the ability to take hard decisions. A person cannot make hard decisions, hold unpopular positions, or stand tall for what he believes unless he knows who he is and feels comfortable with that. So for him, edge is the ability to take hard decisions and difficult decisions. And therefore, when you start getting into leadership, some of you will start your own companies or do whatever. You have to say, do you have that ability? If you don't have that ability, that's not leadership. Can you say, this is not OK? Go back, start again, etc. right? And of course. Huge issue. Again, I keep saying Indians. Remember, I served in the Indian Army. I can't prove my patriotism more than what I've done. But I really mean it as an old man in this country that our execution skills as a nation are poor. We do not have goals. We don't set goals. And we say, I will get there. I will reach. That is execution. And leadership is nothing if you don't execute. No point talking. No point saying big, big things and announcing 10 lakh crores and this crores and all that, ultimately you've got to do it. So that's execution, right? And you want to try the P elements? Pardon? Power. power. Uh, no, you don't need power. Gandhiji had no power. Right? Passion. Krishna, do you get one chocolate already? Here, you get one more. Come. OK. So passion. So. That's, that's why I like this book, because it tries to tell you in simple terms what every element is. It, it, there are chapters on finance, there are chapters on hiring, there are chapters on people leadership, 
So, get a copy of winning if I have made you interested in that area. We go to the next book, totally different genre, completely different area, it is called prisoners of geography. Now, <coughs> if you are citizens of the world, you must understand the whole world, not just your discipline. So, it is important to know why America, do you know why Afghanistan right now, anyone? Why is there a problem in Afghanistan? That is a military reason, what is the real reason of Afghanistan? Pardon? That is a power game between superpowers, ok. What else? Religion, they are all Muslims, not religion. Pardon? of their interpretation of religion, right? Okay. Now, sure, all these are probably true, but this is a brilliant book, how it tells you 10 maps that explain the world. And it uses the basis of geography to understand how history has taken shape because of geography. Okay. So, looks interesting. How many of you think it is interesting? Okay. Now, I will just explain a couple of things, because you have got to really buy it and my idea was to just say, okay. there is this incredible map of Africa. If you have ever seen maps of Africa, how many of you have seen maps of Africa in school? Did you find something very unusual of countries of Africa and the maps? What are they? Wonderful. Tanuj, right? Yes, Tanuj, yes, wonderful. You, will, you should get. If you get the next reason why? then you really get chocolates. Uh, so, basically, uh, I, what I do is that when the colleges help, they give them the line and that makes the colleges divided because they do not have a faculty. Why? You are absolutely right, but why did that happen? The same problem in Afghanistan, by the way. There is a line bit is between Pakistan and Afghanistan. What is the line called? You should try IS. Good. The Duran line. So, there is a Duran line. Who made it? Some Mr. Duran, right? But they did not understand that they are Pashtuns and you do not divide the Pashtuns like this and say this side half Pashtun, then this side half Pashtun. They will never work, right? And the Pashtuns care a damn about that Duran line, right? Similarly, you go to Burma, India, and Myanmar. Burma, Myanmar, there is a range, a little range where I have served. That is why I was reading yesterday again. And there is a range, it is called the Patkai range, it is a little mountain range. This side is India and this side is Burma. And the tribals, Noctes and Wangchus, they live like this. Because in the good old days, the water line, right, was the dividing line between tribes. And tribes have been there for thousands of years. So, the Noctes will live one side, another tribal one side, they did not really care for this thing. But the Britishers came and drew one line and said that side Burma, this side India, tribals do not care, right. So, that is the sort of things that you learn when you read prisoners of geography. And just like what you said, Tanuj, that Africa has lots of problems because of six colonial empires from the British to the French to the Portuguese to the Spanish to the Dutch. Who else is there in Britain? Spain, Portugal little bit of Germany, but basically Italy, there is Italy. So, very little of France, France, Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast. and So, all these countries did something called a scramble for Africa, right, because they needed raw materials for their industrialization and they just raped Africa. They just went in and just took it. And when they started clashing with each other, they had a treaty called quiz homework. Okay, they had a, I think it is called the Balfour Declaration. So, they went there and they said, we will sort of decide, they say all sat together, they said, oh, isko aise kaat do, aise kaat do, isko aise kaat do. This side, this country, this side, this country and they cut the countries up. When they left, the tribes started fighting with each other because they did not care for these boundaries. So, that is the sort of stuff you will learn if you get a copy of Prisoners of Geography. If you only, re, re, you know, do 
YouTube and Wikipedia and those sort of things, you will never get the perspective that you get from books. That is the other part I am saying. Do not lose the habit of reading and read widely. Go beyond your disciplines. In spite of all the time it takes for you to do 150 credits. How many? How many credits do you know undergrad? undergrad? Whatever time it takes, you still have to do sport and still have to read widely. Okay, So that is what I am saying. And the PhDs have 18 hours of work. So, this is that Afghanistan thing which I was tell, telling you. Okay, Central to this area sometimes called Pashtunistan. Okay, That is here. The main ethnic groups in the Afghan Pakistan area did not fit into the border that was imposed on them by the Duran line. <coughs> Many of these groups continue to identify more with their tribes beyond the border than the nation. So, that is just Afghanistan, but these are virtually every big country in the world. You will understand tomorrow you may go to Korea, tomorrow you go to Germany, you have to understand that country. And you can't go there and start understanding, start understanding now. Okay? Okay, that is those stra incredible straight lines, right? Does India have borders like that? Look at that. Libya, Egypt, boom. Sudan, Egypt, like that, right? So, that is the reason why it happens. I am going to end with this amazing book. Has anyone heard of this author called Ayn Rand? Little bit, Chetna. Which one? The, the, Howard the Howard Rook one, the Fountainhead. Okay. So, Ayn Rand is an iconic author. Any author which lasts 100 years has to be brilliant. Again, millions and millions of copies sold. This is the only place she wrote. I read it when I was 17. It, you can read it in about one hour. Okay? What is the play about? I will tell you the story of this play and therefore, I have to end with fiction, Tanuj, right? because fiction teaches you a lot. The story is like this, the play is like this. There is this brilliant entrepreneur businessman and as he was growing, he had a secretary who he was very fond of relationship and the business started failing. And as the business started failing, an American businessman of even bigger size said, I will bail him out. That big businessman's daughter happened to meet Faulkner, Bjorn Faulkner and they got married. And that secretary uh, sort of continued meeting or not meeting because it is a play and it is a courtroom drama and one day three people go, I am making it really short, go up on the top of the 50th floor and either James Faulkner committed suicide and jumped off because his business was failing and other things were going wrong or his secretary threw him off in jealousy. That is the play. Now, the beautiful part of the play is it does not conclude. In every place that they stage the play, in the beginning they invite people from the audience as the jury and they show the courtroom where both the defendant and the what is the other lawyer called? Uh, the defendant and the prosecution lawyer state the case. On one side it looks like it was suicide, on another side it looks as if it was a murder, right? And then the jury of that audience of that day of that city decides whether it is guilty or not. And depending on that, the next part, the last part of the play gets staged, right? And when you read the book, you also do not know what really happened. It is for you to make interpretations based on your own perceptions of life and your own understanding <coughs> of what the story could have been. So, when I was young and I looked at it and I said to myself that there are no blacks and whites in life. There are no this is right and that is wrong, right? So, there is lots of shades of grey and that is how life is going to be and that is what you need to resolve about 
extreme situations and ethical dilemmas. So, she says in the beginning as an introduction, the events feature the confrontation of two extremes, two opposite ways of facing existence, passionate, self assertive, self confidence, ambition, audacity, independence, which is the way that young businessman lived his life or conventionality, servility, envy, hatred, power lust. So, that is the sort of conflict that is there in life and there are many other such conflicts, but the basic element of the story is there are everything in life is not black and white, there is grays and grays and you know you will keep making those choices. So, that is the five books, four books, five books. Uh, I am only telling you about this book without even telling you about it, only the title is K start with a Y. Simon Sinek is also of course, you will these days get everything on YouTube, you will have Simon Sinek talk to you, but he says everything that you do in your life start with a Y. If you are a student, ask yourself why. If you are a SNU, ask yourself why. If you have taken a particular course, ask yourself why, right and everything starts with a Y. If you play sport, ask yourself why. I have given you an easy answer, you do not know why, but you have got four beautiful hormones which happen to you, you cannot see, they go from your body and go into your brain through the nervous system and it is good for you, just as chocolate is good for you, ok. Chocolate is obvious because you are tasting it. So, here we go, this is the choices you make in your life just like Ayn Rand's uh, play, but whether you want to smoke or do ganja or beer or you want to spend all your time on your mobile or gaming or you know religion or keep breaking hearts many times, it can happen or eat junk food 19th hole or spend your time only doing this which is reading about your discipline or you want to also spend time playing sport and exposing yourself to this incredible university where people are there from all walks of life, if you are from one background do not spend all your time with Telangana, Vidya Gyan, Bihar, Delhi, Dwarka, spend people, spend time with different people, right and say I do not know your culture, I like to spend time with you, make friends with different people, it is choices you make, right. So, all these are choices you make about what you want to do, lectures to go to, right and the choices that you make in your life you will see are, are also folks in the road right and you decide the fork in the road that you want to do. So, that is broadly the story, thank you so much, I definitely have exceeded time, but Rajiv sir said you could go 10, 15 minutes extra. So, thank you so much and it is an absolute to joy to have students in class. So, any questions? Yes. That is a brilliant question, right. Brilliant question. So, uh, should life be a race about winning or it should be about experiences? I would say life should be a journey of goals that you set for yourself, right. Some of those goals you may or may not achieve, but uh, it is a question of purpose, right, which is that you have to ask yourself and as you know. Uh, uh, Indian religious will also tell you that every stage of your life there is a particular purpose. So, ask yourself what the purpose is for that period of your life and see whether you are going to go there, but I think it is important to have a purpose and not drift along, right. Drifting along with just having experiences is like you can be a sadhu or something, like that. but you have a purpose, you have to figure what that purpose is. Like you said, what are your childhood dreams, are you going to sort of get there, but you cannot be disappointed if it does not happen right you got to then change track and say maybe it's something else and do that and but still my my view is there should be goals right there should be at least three four more questions yes traveling solo or traveling with oh I uh, you again very personal, it is an individual sort of a uh, choice that you make. Uh, I think both are wonderful, uh, obviously when you are young as a family you are 
By the way, if you ask me traveling by train or traveling by plane, obviously traveling by train by far. But you will say, what do I do for two days when I can reach in three hours? Imagine seeing the length and breadth of this country through a train window, right? And spending time yourself with reflection. It's great to do that alone, right? But that's the other thing. Don't get married too early because then you have no choice. There's no more solo. And then there are children which happen, then it becomes four. So it's always a challenge if you if you sort of so but yeah, both Dr. Tuli, by the way, he's not here, but he's amazing. When I met him first time, I said, What do you do, Dr. Tuli? He said, Sometimes I just decide I'm going on a trek. So I said, Where do you go? He said, I go to ISBT and decide where to go. <laughs> serious, I'm telling you serious. I said, So where do you go when you go to ISBT? I said, फिर उतरते कहाँ हो वो देख लेता हूँ जब कहीं पहुँचते हैं ये अच्छी जगह लगती है तो चले आ बीबी को क्या बोलते हो ए सेट शी नोस शी इज बीन सी फॉर थर्टी इयर्स सो आई डिड टेल माय सेल्फ आई सेट दैट लुक्स वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग आई वाइफ इज नॉट गोइंग अलाउ यू टू डू दैट जस्ट डिसअपेयर नो फोन राइट एंड ही कम्स बैक आफ्टर फाइव सिक्स डेज बिकॉज फॉर हिम स्पेंडिंग टाइम अलोन इज डीपली इंपॉर्टेंट सो फॉर सम ऑफ अस इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू स्पेंड टाइम विद योर सेल्फ सो ही डज दैट सो आई गिव यू शुड आस्क हिम What do you do when you go alone? Yeah. Sir, do you have any regrets? Do I have any regret? This talk is not about me. <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, life has forks in the road, right? And I love the phrase fork, you know, forks the road. You reach here and you have a choice, and you take the choice, uh, and you go on one. But the interesting part is you can only guess what's on the other fork of the road. You never experienced that life, right? So regret is about saying I could have done this without knowing it could have happened there, right? So I think your life is about making the most of the life that you have and making the most of the choice that you have. I also nearly died twice. Carnegie, Randy died to pancreatic cancer. I nearly died of smallpox when I was five. So my earliest memories of being in a hospital bed for one year, and then I also was in Chachin Glacier at twenty thousand, twenty-one thousand five hundred for. 33 days of my life dug inside a snow hole, uh, life-changing experience, right? And uh, unbeatable because you came back alive. Could have died. So no regrets. Sure, let's ask. Le uh, yeah, go ahead. Is there a question? Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, you had a question. Yeah. Okay. So during the pandemic, because we were after the first wave, it wasn't so bad. But we used to do classes, right? Optional, 50 people register, and we tried to sort of conver converse about it. Obviously, I am not a spiritual guru. Who knows all those answers? I have some experiences I can share with you, but my life journey I can explain, right? So I went to NDA National Defence Academy after finishing school with no plan. Someone else, my uh, schoolmate, my classmate, filled that NDA form, right? And I said, "Forge me, thodi jaunga. I am too bright to join the army." I was, you know, full of myself, but he filled the form. And he filled, took 28 rupees from his father to pay for my form. And I went and did some exam. And I passed all those exams and then went for SSB, which is the f sort of test for three days. Passed that. Then I sort of made a decision, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about what do I do with my life and purpose. This looks okay. No more uh, college journey and look for a job. And father's a poor professor. How much does he look after three children? I said, chalo. But I love the National Defense Academy, I love the place, so and therefore I found purpose at 17. It was just luck, right? But some people have to figure what you really want to do. But I think through conversations with many people, you will start sort of figure. And uh, that's how it is. I think 50% of people have clear purposes at 17 and 18, 50% don't, right? And you'll figure it. College journey is also about that. It's about trying to figure that as you go along. 
and co conversation with many people will help you. Yeah. Okay, I, ha I hate the phrase, I hate the phrase, you, you will at 17 or 18 hear it from Gopal Karnakaran that there is nothing called work life balance. There are some phrases which the world throws at us and you start using it. There is nothing called social distancing. There is physical distancing. Two and a half years ago, two years ago, somebody used the phrase social distancing, whole world. Why is it social distancing? Online you are not social distance, phone you are not social distance, you are physically distanced. So, it is a wrong phrase. Similarly, is work life balance. You know what the balance is? The, the, you cannot separate work from your life. There is work and there is leisure. There is work and there is spare time or other time but you cannot separate work from your life. Your life has to be your work and your work has to be your life. That is if you do not enjoy what you are doing and you are only working 9 to 5 to get happy time at 5 o'clock. For example, another thing I hate is a, it is a lovely uh, name for a restaurant, but it is not a great philosophy of your life. What, which is what? Thank God it is Friday restaurant right it's a restaurant tgif thank god it's friday is the name of a restaurant right and it is such a nice catchy phrase but that's not philosophy of life the philosophy of life is i love my monday to friday you got to love your monday to friday that's how you should live your life right so there is nothing called work life balance if you love your work then you're going to spend all your time doing that right why do you need to do not do that but you must have a work leisure balance because without leisure and without sport you can't be good at your work right one day my wife asked me i you know this is on youtube live my wife may see it so be careful she is in dubai so one day in 2008 she asked me that you disappear every day at 5:30 with your badminton racket and with Roger, our dog, and go away. And sh I come back sometimes 6.30, 6.45. She goes to school at 7. She was a teacher at that time. She says, it's as if your badminton is more important than my, than me. So, you don't reply to your wife. <laughs> but inside me, immediately I said, that's actually true in the morning. <laughs> because my badminton is more important than anything else in the morning or whatever sport I play. It is, right? Because that's my life. Right? I have to get that exercise. So, you have got to figure uh, how do you get that balance. Right? You cannot be working all the time, that is not going to work. So, you have got to figure what is your leisure. Yeah. No, I think it is a simple answer, yes of course, if you feel you should slow down your life, you should, it is simple, yeah. About the famous, the famous book Bhagavad Gita, I think it is the most incredible book I have ever read. I also was lucky to read an, I am mean, not a religious person, I do not go to temples, I have never, uh, I, I don't believe in God, right? Uh, so that's a personal position that I'm in. But having said that, as a treatise of how to live your life and to understand life, I think the Bhagavad Gita is an amazing book. I've uh, read the Quran in parts. I've read uh, a lot of Buddhism. Uh, I've read the Bible uh, certainly in parts. But I think these are all amazing religious books about ways of life. And I think all great religious books say the same thing about humanity and to believe in humanity, right? It is human beings who interpret it differently, but the Bhagavad Gita is just an incredible book to read. I read it at your age, I was about 20 at the Indian Military Academy in my third term. I read a copy of uh, Purohit Swami, it was in my father's library, again easy to you know sort of read because there are books all over. There were only 750 copies ever made of that particular uh, Bhagavad Gita. He took it to a poet called W. B. Yeats in England and Purohit Swami but it is a very simple explanation of the Gita and I do not know if you get it online now, but it is a it is a book at your age, all religious books are good to read to at least understand the essence of what they are saying and you will realize the essence of all religions is be good.
and be good and also have a way of life. I think it is uh, Bhagavad Gita is a great, uh, amazing, amazing book. Aditi, yes. I have to recognize you without without with the mask there. Yeah. What, what my dad says is focus on one thing. So I think I think if he's talking about sport. There is a place in the world for being a generalist, and there's a place in the world for being a specialist, right? It's it's the sort of choice you make, right? So uh, again, it's it's a particular human choice, and there, like Dr. Galande in the previous uh, talk talked about genes and how genes shape who you are. It's not necessarily your father or mother's genes. How do you know? By the way, as a parent, you're all going to be parents soon. Some of you are, but you're all going to be parents. How do you know that your child is not exactly a replication of your own genes? Uh, you are not responsible for your child just because they happen to be, he or she happens to be yours. How do you know that? When do you know that? How do you know for sure? Akash has two children, so how do you know that? And lovely and singers. So the only time you know that as a parent is when you have the second child. Then you realize the totally two different people, unless there's a twin, right? Twins are quite different. But you realize same parent, same background, same home, same environment. This one is like that, right? So there are parts of which which are so individual, shaped by our genes more than even our environment and how the brain sort of moves based on that. So a lot of those choices about whether it is one sport like this, Andrea Gussie anyone knows? When he was 5 he started playing tennis because his father said play tennis, he built a, scot, a tennis court in his home and he played, played, played. When he finished his career at 34 I think he won a grand slam, run 8 grand slams if I am not wrong but uh, he, run, he won all 4, he said I hated the game. <laughs> He hated the game. He said his whole life started after he finished and married Steffi Graf, etc. But he never liked the game, right? So you got to sort of love what you do and not really, you know, go that way. I had the same problem as you. I couldn't give up badminton for football or for cricket or for, I had to play everything. So I was never, I never played for India. I never played for state, but I love the sport. So it's it's my choice. I could have probably just played one sport. Uh, it's true about your disciplines, right? Some people like to be generalist, some people like to concentrate like that. Your choice. Yeah. By competing, <laughs> if you want to be best at squash, you play with Sunita and Anjali and you'll know. Krishna, you're not winning. Huh? No, I think I think you have to test yourself, right? You've got to you have to uh, so that's another thing. A lot of people tell you to follow your passion, right? But actually, you have to follow what, like Krishna is asking, you have to follow what you're good at. That will give you joy. That will give you continued sort of enjoyment because you're getting better and better. So it's a little different for following your passion. It's a little different. You're not necessarily that I'm passionate about cricket, but I may be good at football, and therefore I should probably play football because I'll, I'll get better at it. And the being better is the joy. So the only way is to keep testing yourself. I think we are sort of done. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Such a joy to have students in our class.